I fell for what seemed like a very long time. Bloosh! I hit the water feet first and plowed beneath the surface in a pillar of bubbles. The cold shocked me. The water was like ice. And just a few feet away was the intimidating steel wall of the tanker, sliding past at what felt like incredible speed. I kicked my feet and began to rise to the surface. I've been a swimmer since I was little, but it frightened me, being this far out in the water, this deep. This wasn't a pool or a pond. This was the ocean, 20 miles from land. I broke the surface and gasped a lungful of air and a mouthful of salt water. What had looked like a little choppiness from up on the ship felt like towering waves down here. I couldn't see any of the others. All I could see was the side of the ship. Come on, Cassie, I told myself. Morph. Do it. This is no place for a person. There is just about nothing as helpless as a human being in the ocean. Without my ability to morph, I would not have lasted an hour. I felt the change begin, and I focused on morphing. At first, I thought it would kill me. I soon had most of the weight of the dolphin, with nothing but my human feet paddling to keep my head above water. My arms had already become flippers. A wave crashed over me, leaving me sputtering from my mouth and my blowhole at the same time. I realized I could no longer keep my head above water. I took a deep lungful and let myself sink. As my eyes went from human to dolphin, my underwater vision improved. I could see other figures kicking and writhing in the water around me. Jake half-changed, Rachel almost complete, Marco with a dolphin grin, looking amused. Then, with a kick of my newly completed tail, I knew I was safe. I had made the change. I was a dolphin in a dolphin's world. The human clumsiness, the human cold, the human fear of an alien environment, all evaporated. I was warm and in control, and right where I should be. Everyone okay? One by one, they answered. We had made it. Too bad this was just the easy part of the mission. Well, that was fun, Marco said sardonically. Let's never ever do it again. Cassie, Jake prodded me. I tried to relax, to let my human mind recede just a little. I needed to listen to the dolphin instincts. I needed to understand the whale's instructions. Something no human could ever do. Not far, I said. We're just a few... Um, forget it. There's no word for it. Just believe me, we're close. After you, Cassie, Jake said. I felt a strange... I felt strange, taking the lead. But only I knew the way. We traveled near the surface for a while. This made it confusing for me, because whales go deeper, and the world the whales saw and knew was a deeper world than I, as a dolphin, experienced. And yet, I knew I was going in the right direction. My echolocating clicks painted murky, half-understood pictures in my mind of underwater hills and valleys and rifts. I felt currents tugging at me. I sensed changes in water temperature. In the end, I just knew. Okay, everyone, get a good lungful, I said. We surfaced, blew out the stale air, and filled our lungs with the good, clean ocean air. Hey, what's that? It was Rachel. What? I asked her. Over there. It's a helicopter. We all watched as a helicopter flew low and very slowly over the water. It was just a few hundred yards away, and with our dolphin vision, we could see it as well as we might have with our human eyes. But as it flew closer, I could see that it was dragging a cable through the water. Some sort of sensor, Jake speculated. They're looking for something in the water, Marco agreed. It's them, I said. No one argued. We all knew it was true. Controllers were flying that helicopter. The Yerks were here. Chapter 17 Everyone take in as much air as you can, I said again. We're going deep. We dove and swam almost straight down, 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 leaving the bright barrier behind, away from the sun, away from the light, away from the air that we needed just as much as humans did. I echolocated a school of fish ahead, just below us, but we weren't there to eat lunch. We swam through the fish, and still we headed down, down until we could see the ocean floor beneath us. We leveled off and skimmed across the ocean floor. 
like low-flying jets racing at treetop level, over waving fields of seaweed, through darting schools of fish, over jutting extrusions of rock encrusted by barnacles and home to a thousand bizarre crabs and lobsters and urchins and worms and snails. Ahead was a ridge, a sort of long, low hill. We sailed over it. I'm starting to feel like maybe taking a breath would be a good would be a good thing, Rachel said. How much farther? We all saw it at the same time. Saw it, yes, but could hardly believe it. I've become used to seeing impossible things. Aliens, spaceships, my own friends turning into animals. But this was just plain mind-boggling. It was round. As round as a plate. A very large plate. From one side to the other. The diameter must have been half a mile. It was covered by a transparent dome. Clear glass, or whatever it is the Andalites use for glass. And within the dome, protected from the crushing force of the water, was what looked very much like a park. A park in a plastic dome at the bottom of the ocean. There was grass. More blue than green, but it looked like grass. There were trees like huge stems of broccoli, and other trees like orange and blue asparagus spears. At the center was a small lake, crystal clear blue water. And from the water grew fantastic transparent green crystals in shapes like eccentric snowflakes. Whoa, Marco said. Man, Jake commented. Is this what you expected, Cassie? Rachel asked me. I I had dreams. I saw flashes of something. But this, this is unbelievable. I think that maybe a hatch down there, Marco said. You see the part that sticks out? Let's try it, Jake said. I can't hold my breath much longer. We arched down toward a part of the glass dome that seemed different from the rest. As we got closer, we could really begin to feel the size of the dome. It was like approaching one of those huge stadiums where they play football, but even bigger, if you can imagine that. It's a hatch, Rachel reported. She was a little ahead of the rest of us. I think it's a kind of glass door. On the other side, there's a little room, and then another door that leads into the do dome. There's a little red panel beside the outer door. Let's either try it or surface, Marco said urgently. That red panel, that's got to be the doorknob, Jake said. Here goes. Let's hope this works. He pressed his beak against the panel. Instantly, the outer door opened. We should try this one at a time. See if it's safe, Marco said. Not enough time, I said. My lungs were burning. I needed air. The four of us swam in through the outer door. There was a second red panel. I punched it with my beak and closed the door, and the door closed, sealing us into a small glass room. We could see out and up into the ocean all around, but the side leading into the dome was opaque. I knew we'd end up in an aquarium sooner or later, Marco said. The water began to drain from the room, slowly, a little at a time. This opened an area of air at the top of the enclosure. I raised my blowhole and sucked in the blessed oxygen. Okay, let's morph, Jake said. I had already started. By the time the enclosure was half-drained, I could stand on my own human feet. We made it, Marco said, after his human mouth reformed. I don't know where we made it to, but we made it. The enclosure was empty now. The four of us stood there barefoot, dressed only in our soggy morphing outfits. There was one last red panel beside the door leading into the dome. Ready? Jake asked. As ready as I'll ever be, Marco said. Jake pressed it with his hand. The door slid open. I felt a wave of warm, incredibly fragrant air rush in. I caught a glimpse of... Then a brilliant flash of light. And suddenly, I was unconscious. Chapter 18 I opened my eyes. I was staring straight up. I was on my back. Above me, I could see the ocean all around. High overhead, fish swam by, sparkling. Higher still, I could see the bright barrier between the sea and the sky, but it was very far away. I rolled my head to the side. Jake was beside me, still unconscious. There was blue grass under my head. I looked the other way. Yeah! Do not move. I stun you to see what you are, but if you move, I will destroy you. 
He stood on four delicate hooves, looking, at first glance, like a pale blue and tan deer or antelope. But he had a strong upper body, like a mythical centaur with two small arms and many-fingered hands. His face was almost triangular, built around two huge almond-shaped eyes. There was a small vertical slit where his nose should have been, and nothing where his mouth should have been. From atop his head rose twin horns, only they were not horns. They each ended in an eye, and turned this way and that, independent of his main eyes. He seemed gentle, quizzical, almost delicate, until you noticed the tail. The tail was like a scorpion's. It was thick, powerful, and ended in a wicked scythe blade that literally glittered along, along its razor-sharp edges. I knew what he was. There was no mistaking an andalite when you see one. And there was no question about what he was holding in his hand, either. It looked a lot like a Yerk dragon beam. He was pointing it at me. The others were waking up all around me. What the... Oh, Marco said. Please tell me that's a real Andalite and not Visor 3. Suddenly, without warning, the Andalite's tail arched forward. The blade stopped inches from Marco's face. Visor 3. Do not speak that name, the Andalite thought spoke. Okay, Marco said slowly. Whatever you want. We are friends, I said. I don't know you, the Andalite said. But he withdrew his tail and Marco started breathing again. You called me, I said. We've come to help you. Called? You heard my call? He fixed all four of his eyes on me. What are you? Human, a person of Earth. I have seen images of your kind. My call was to my cousins. How did you hear it? I don't know, I admitted. I heard it in my dreams. So did a friend of mine. We guessed it was an Andalite. We wanted to help. What do you know of Andalites? My people are not known to humans. You do not travel the stars. You know only your own planet. My elder cousins have taught me this. We knew one Andalite. We were with him when when he was killed. The Andalite narrowed his main eyes. Who was this Andalite you say was killed? I searched my memory for his name. He had told us, but it was a strange, long name. I can't remember all of his name, but part of it was Prince Alfangor. The Andalite jerked as if he'd been hit. His entire body seemed to quiver. His deadly tail arched high in the air. Prince Alfangor? Nobody could kill Alfangor. He is the greatest warrior ever. No one could kill him. Someone did, Jake said. We were there. Who? Who do you claim killed Alfangor? The one whose name you don't want us to speak, I said softly. The Andalite held his head high, but his tail sagged and dragged down to the grass. He lowered his weapon. He was my brother. Did... Did he die well, in battle? Jake answered. He died protecting us, and defying the Yerks to the end. At the very last moment, he struck with every weapon he had. The Andalite closed his main eyes for a brief moment. My brother was a great warrior. His cousins loved him. His enemies feared him. No more can be said of any Andalite warrior. I was surprised by what Jake said next. I have lost a brother, too. He's one of them, a controller. The Andalite opened his eyes. And you, human, do you serve the Yurks or fight them? I fight them. We fight them. With what weapons? Do you have powerful weapons? Only the weapon your brother gave us, I said. The power to morph. Alfangor gave you that? It is never done. He seemed disturbed. The situation would have to be very bad for him to give you morphing capability. The situation is worse than you think, Marco said. The Yurks seem to know you're here. Some piece of Andalite wreckage washed up to the shore. They are up on the surface right now. For the first time, the Andalite seemed uncertain. What is your plan? To get you out of here and hide you, I said. You came only to rescue me? This is true? Yes. 
He smiled with his eyes, just as Prince Elfangor had done. You will be tired after this last morph. You will need to rest. A little while, yes, I agreed. What is this? Rachel asked. This dome, I mean, it's like a park or something? This is the main part of an Andalite dome ship. It is where we live. The engines and the war bridge are in a long section that sticks out from the bottom. This is the dome that is perched on top. Like a mushroom? Or an umbrella, I suggested. The Andalite just looked blank. Never mind, I said. During the great battle in orbit over your planet, the dome was separated from the rest of the ship. Why? The Andalite dug at the grass with his forehoof. I... I was too young for battle by the laws of our people. Besides, the rest of the ship maneuvers better without the dome. You're a kid? I mean, like a young person? Marco asked. Yes. Are you the only one left? The only Andalite here? Yes. I am alone. When the blade ship appeared unexpectedly, they caught us off guard. I saw the main section burn. Jack and Beans damaged orbital stabilization of this dome. It fell. It splashed into the ocean and sank to the bottom. I had been here for many weeks, hoping that my cousins would come for me, hoping that some survived. Finally, I risked sending out a microwave call. A mirror wave call. It works by... He stopped and looked embarrassed. I am not supposed to explain Andalite technology. My brother will... He would have been angry with me. Just you survived, I said sadly. Just me, he said. No prince. No warriors. I felt a sinking in the pit of my stomach. I think the others felt the same way. I guess we'd all kind of been hoping this Andalite would be like the Prince, a leader. Someone who could take over the battle. Someone who would know more than we did. We're young too, I said. Too young to fight, according to the laws of our people. But still you fight. We feel like we don't have a choice. Look, we don't even know your name. This is Jake, Rachel, Marco. I'm Cassie. There's one more. His name is Tobias. I am Aximili Escaruth Isil. We all kind of stared. Ax, Marco said. Pleased to meet you. Who is your prince? One by one, we looked at Jake. Oh, give me a break, Jake said. I'm not anyone's prince. But the Andalite had stepped forward. He bowed his head and lowered his tail. I will fight for you, Prince Jake, until I can return to my cousins.